Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Wednesday, uh, the 5th of March. It's 1.30 in the afternoon here on the west coast of British Columbia. I'm Kip Davis. I'm a biblical scholar and a specialist in early Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thanks so much for joining me today for this, uh, is it a special live stream? Maybe, maybe it is special. We'll try and make it special. Right. So good to see some, uh, some friends here. Nice to see you. Uh, this guy, <laughs> James Apperson, uh, Derek from Myth Vision. It's, uh, good to have you out. My friend, Dapper Dinosaur and, uh, Captain Dadpool. Tomer never sleeps, and uh, it's a good thing, because uh, without Tomer, I'm pretty sure YouTube would fail. Uh, Starsong, hello, nice to see you. Nitty, good to see you. So I will try and keep an eye on the chat as best I can. Oh, uh, there we go, yeah. Lucindy, yes, it's good to see you. Uh, yeah, so I uh, hope everyone's well. Hope everyone's doing okay. Um, I uh, I'm I'm drinking the last of uh, one of my bottles of bourbon uh, today. I ordinarily don't promote uh, afternoon drinking, but uh, but we're gonna make an exception today. So why are we here? What's going on? Um. I am here to take a look at uh, at a video that I watched. I guess it was last week. I think uh, I, I I think is when it came on, and that's when it sort of hit my orbit. Uh, so I I participate in a handful of different chat threads with different people on um, on Messenger. And uh, in one of these uh, chat threads, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about this uh, this video uh, from this guy. Uh, I don't know if uh, if you've heard of him before. I think his name is is Insipid Theosophy. No, that's that's wrong. I think that's wrong. Inspiring Philosophy. That's it. Uh, Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy. So um, there was quite a bit of discussion about this uh, this video that he made where he was uh, reviewing a response that appeared on uh, um, Polygia's channel. My, uh, my good friend Polygia made uh, a video with Professor Bart Ehrman uh, to promote Bart's course, Bart did a uh, a course on the Gospel of Matthew back at the beginning of February, and so this video was made to to promote Bart's course, in which, you know, as Paul does, he showed a bunch of clips from various uh, Christian apologists, including um, Tim McGrew and uh, Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy. There, there might have been a couple others in there. Uh, I, I don't remember. Um, and asked uh, Professor Ehrman just to just to comment and respond to them. So uh, Michael uh, was, for the most part, uh, generally pretty cordial. He was excited about the fact that uh, a luminary uh, like Bart Ehrman uh, had had uh, um, had his attention. Uh, so, or, or he had, uh, Professor Ehrman's attention. He was excited about the fact that, uh, that Professor Ehrman was reviewing some of his stuff. Uh, but he really got stuck on this issue of the, uh, the story of Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem as it occurs in Matthew chapter 21. And this story is pretty dramatically different in Matthew 21, when compared to this, the other synoptic versions in, in Mark and in Luke, which basically follows uh, Mark directly. So this was, the, this was the topic of discussion in our chat thread, because uh, Michael really wanted to, to take 
Professor Ehrman uh, to task for just not knowing the scholarship on this. And in the process of reviewing uh, Ehrman's response, Michael pulled up a bunch of information from various commenters on the past, such as uh, Craig Keener and Stephen Carlson and Robert Gundry, um, Bernard Batto, which is sort of a funny name to be uh, drawing into this discussion, because as far as I know, uh, Bernard Batto is, is basically a, uh, a, uh, um, a Hebrew Bible, ancient Near Eastern scholar. So anyways, he brought in all this, all this information uh, and was attempting to make the argument that uh, Matthew, contrary to what uh, Bart was saying, uh, actually knows, um, actually knows, sorry, actually knows Hebrew very well. He clearly knows the phenomenon of uh, Hebrew poetic parallelism really well, and he is probably interpreting, he's, he's translating directly out of the Hebrew Bible in this passage, and he pulled up a bunch of uh, citations from various pieces of secondary literature. Uh, we were discussing this uh, in this, this, this chat thread that I'm involved in. I think half the people involved in this particular chat are pretty proficient uh, with the Greek, at least. If there's, I, I don't know about the the Hebrew, but but uh, certainly pretty um, um, pretty good with the Greek, um, and and as a rule, as as a result, you know, we're looking through uh, Michael's arguments and going like, what what is he getting at here? Uh, why is he making such a big deal out of this? So. Um, I feel like I kind of got drawn into uh, directing a response to this because this isn't the first time this has come up. And this is something that if you know me, um, you know that, uh, oh, you know, I have to, I have to pull this one up right away. Uh, Gnostic informant, uh, Neil, thank you very much for the very generous super chat not knowing Greek and then trying to refute someone on the New Testament is a crime punishment. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, I don't think. I would certainly say it's unwise. I'll go I'll go I'll go to that that uh, that length uh, at least. but uh, thanks so much for the uh, super chat, Neil. So um, what I want to do today is I want to go through this video that uh, that this video response that Michael put together. I want to correct uh, a bunch of mistakes that he made. I want to talk about the problems with this passage and the various ways in which scholars work through these issues, issues with regards to language and with regards to translation and with regards to um, uh, literary conventions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're going to do that. I will uh, answer questions uh, when I'm finished. I'd like to. I'm. I thought I'd, I'd like to get through the video in like an hour and then just reserve the rest of the time for questions. Uh, as always, if um, if you have questions for me about this topic or, or anything else, feel free to ask. The best way to get my attention because I'm doing like two things at once here. I've got both my screens working, which helps a little bit, um, but I can barely do, you know, one thing at a time. I'm not a great multitasker. So if you really want to get my attention, if there's a question you're dying to ask. The best way to do it is to super chat it. Um, and uh, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll go through the video. Uh, then we will uh, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, address some of your questions. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, it's true. Dapper dinosaur. I do need a third screen. Um, I actually, I, I feel like I could, I could, uh, use a computer upgrade altogether. Uh, I'm a little worried <laughs> about this one, but, uh, hopefully it survives the day at least. Right. So, um, I think, uh, without, uh, uh oh hey it's good to see you. thanks for thanks for stopping by rob good to see you let's try and build some bridges here i'm i'm interested in doing that um sorry 
trying to hide that. Uh, and I, I, I certainly don't want this to be antagonistic. I, what I would like, honestly, is for Michael to watch this, to understand the criticism, to understand the arguments that I'm going to be making with regards to this particular passage. And like Michael, uh, you seem to have an interest in the languages. You've been doing this publicly for a long time now. You've been doing this in the online space for a lot longer than I have. A lot of your content dives into these specific issues. I just don't understand. I personally don't understand that with this sort of investment you've already made, why you don't go another step further? Why don't you you make the effort to go and actually learn uh, some Greek, learn some Hebrew, so that you can improve your own level of argumentation and so that you can avoid mistakes. Um, th that's my interest here. So, um, yeah, it, uh, yeah, I, I guess, sorry, I'm terrible with the, with the transition things here and, and, and we'll see how this goes. But, um, so, uh, really, I think this is, this rather encapsulates the, uh, the issue quite well. Um, We joke, scholars joke, um, counter apologists joke that uh, you know this is uh, this is the picture that Matthew is is painting in his story. Well, why do why do we think this? What's what's uh, going on here? Um, so I, I I think the best thing to do at this point is uh, is just to get into this. I'm going to open the video. I'm going to play the first set. I've, I've got this broken into three sections. It's about 18 minutes in total. Um, I'm going to play the video. I'm going to stop at the end of each section. I'm going to pull up my own slides then at that point and then, and then walk through uh, the text and walk through the scholarship on this text, walk through my own reading of uh, the issues with regards to this text. So... Um, yeah, and depending on on the interaction and 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 what's going on in the chat, maybe maybe it'll be a good idea to to address questions as we go. Um, but but we'll uh, we'll we'll play this by ear and uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, by the way, also um, I'm just gonna pull uh, the video up here too. I should mention that uh, when I do this, uh, so I'm not I won't be uh, playing um, inspiring philosophies video directly i have actually prepared a uh, like a curated version this this helps for my own sanity i've cut out what i consider irrelevant bits he's got a whole chunk there um in a couple places where he answers super chats i just pulled that stuff out um I, you know i i i i i packed it together so that uh, so so that you know, he's not stumbling over his words like I'm doing right now. Uh, I think it makes things a little bit tighter, um, but I, I thought that was important to point out. So without further ado, let's uh, take a look at what uh, Michael has to say. And if someone could please just give me a, a thumbs up if you can uh, if you can hear the audio. OK, once it starts, that'd be awesome. Let's start with the two donkeys during the triumphal entry. Suppose a biblical error. Did Jesus ride two donkeys into Jerusalem? That's me. In the Gospel of Matthew, it records that the disciples brought Jesus a donkey and its colt. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. In Matthew, says Bart, Jesus' disciples procured two animals for him, a donkey and a colt. They spread their garments over the two of them, and Jesus rode into town straddling them both. It's an odd image, but Matthew made Jesus fulfill the prophecy of Scripture quite literally. Riding on an ass and on a colt, the foal of an ass. Ha, 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 he's doing a circus trick. He's riding both animals at once. How funny. What's the... F so, uh, before we continue, I just want to point out here, and we're going to keep coming back to this point. A critical issue in this whole discussion is the fact that Matthew's account is so dramatically different from what appears in the other synoptics in in uh, Mark and in Luke in Luke and in and in John as a matter of fact Matthew is singularly unique in his presentation of this story and this is something that I just don't think 
uh, Michael. I don't think uh, 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 Tim McGrew here in this clip spend nearly enough time exploring or being curious about. It's the first thing that we do when Bart quotes scripture. Read the text for ourselves. They brought the... Importantly, Tim's going to read the text in English. Michael's going to be dealing with the text in English. The real critical issue here is in how some of this stuff translates into English or into any other modern language. Uh, and when scholars look at these issues from the text themselves, we encounter problems that need to be addressed. The donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks. And he sat on them. What? So real quick, that's the that's the passage in question. Dr. Ehrman says that Matthew is saying Jesus sat on them, meaning the, the two donkeys. And the response is, no, he, they, he sat on the cloaks that were spread on the two donkeys. So just for anyone who may have been confused. What's the antecedent of that last them? Is it the donkey and the colt or is it their cloaks? Well, grammatically, either one could be it. But when we look at A.T. Robertson's commentary on Matthew, and Robertson was a great Greek scholar, Robertson just dryly remarks the garments, of course. The words in Greek might refer to the two animals, but such reference is by no means necessary. Matthew is not careful to distinguish, but common sense can do it. Let's not be stupid. Enough. So just want to point out here, uh, A.T. Robinson died in... Was it 1937? Virtually everything he wrote was pre-Second World War. And, I mean, my, my, my impression is that, uh, in particular, not, not Michael Jones, but in particular guys like, uh, like Tim McGrew, like Lydia McGrew, like uh, Jonathan McClatchy, like uh, my friend Eric Manning from the channel Testify, when it comes to the scholarship that they deal with, they love just sitting there in the pre-war um, scholarly discussion for good reason, because critical biblical scholarship has come a long way, a long, long way since then. Um, and it's probably a lot less comfortable now than it was back in uh, the days of A.T. Robinson et al. Enough said, but you see what Barr did? He gets a chuckle out of his audience and he moves on, having made the authors of scripture seem to be bereft of common sense <laughs> <laughs> i guess i'm just you know too stupid to understand <laughs> yeah so listen bart Ehrman laughs a lot and i think that's that's fabulous uh and it makes me smile uh when he laughs almost as big as uh, a smile when my good friend uh dr jennifer bird laughs so hi right. keep laughing bart Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I Sorry. do my best not to be stupid. So the point that Matthew makes is precisely that this is fulfilling what is said about he's mounted on an ass and on a colt, the full of a donkey. And so they bring him the ass and the donkey. <laughs> so they bring him two animals. That's not what happens in Mark or Luke. And so you have to ask why two animals. And when it says it spread the cloaks on them it doesn't say like on one of them for him to sit on it says on them and so i'm just looking at the greek here because i you know i wasn't expecting this question and so i didn't exactly uh, you know re read the text before so yeah ver it's verse seven and they lay the garments on them and he said yeah okay so so uh, all right so it's actually pretty clear because it says it uses the same greek words they spread them upon them and then it says, and he sat upon them. <laughs> so which them is he talking about? Well, okay, you tell me. <laughs> but but the grammatically. So let me just say, I didn't make this up. You know, it's not, not like this is my stupid reading. The person who actually convinced me of this reading is John Meyer, who's a, well, I mean, Tim won't like this, but he's a Roman Catholic scholar <laughs> who wrote one of the really very best commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew. And he's a he's a very committed he was a very committed Christian and a very devout Roman Catholic. Sorry, but he just he used this passage to say that in his judgment Matthew was probably not not Jewish. 
because Matthew's taking this, this synonymous parallelism from Zechariah and doesn't seem to realize that it's synonymous parallelism. And so he has two animals. <laughs> and the way the synonymous parallelism works in Zechariah is that you, you, you stake one line. This is how it happens in all the poetry in the Old Testament. You, st- you state a line, and then the second line says the same thing in other words. And so it's, it's kind of reinforcing it. But Matthew's obviously taking it in some kind of literal way. So I'm not saying that Matthew is stupid, although Tim's saying I'm stupid, but that's okay. I'm not saying that Matthew is stupid. What I am saying that he's taking this literal, this image literally in a way that doesn't really make any sense to show that Jesus literally fulfilled it. And that's, that's again, that's John Meyer's argument. It's, it's kind of an art, you know, a common argument. I think it's kind of humorous. It's meant, maybe it's meant to be humorous. I don't know, but he does sit on them. <laughs> and so I don't know. Okay, so here is the problem before we go on. It really seems like Dr. Ehrman is just woefully ignorant of the scholarship around this problem. There's a lot more than the one guy he cites on this, and it just seems like, according to his own admission, Dr. Ehrman heard this argument from this Catholic scholar, said, well, that seems likely, and then didn't explore any of the other scholarship around this. And that's important because in my video he's responding to, which I don't even know if he watched the whole thing when he was on Apologia's channel. It seemed like he just watched parts of it. I addressed a lot of his very concerns. So like, here's another interesting paper uh, by Stephen Carlson. Yeah, Stephen Carlson actually wrote a two-part paper on this very issue. Uh, Stephen Carlson's papers on the issue are, are pretty good. Um, I would say that uh, if there is a way to, uh, to, to sort out this problem in such a way that the image provided within the Gospel of Matthew doesn't look ridiculous, as, um, as, as Tim suggested, Carlson's probably got, got the best track on this. I'm not sure that I agree with everything that he says in there, and I'll I'll get to some of this as well. Sorry, let me modify the audio there. Turn on the audio there. Just pulling me back a bit. Sorry. All right. Um. So, but but we'll get to that. Uh, one of the things he notes is proponents of the double donkey reading, like Dr. Ehrman, differ as to the aptness of the reading of Matthew because it relates to the ethnically or educate education of the evangelists. On the one hand, some dub this reading as simple misunderstanding on the part of Matthew, a mistake so blatant that the author of Matthew must have been a Gentile. Here's the important part. Carlson then says, this view is fad rather poorly in recent times, however, and is criticized for failing to account for Matthew's general competence of Jewish matters. So I just want to stop there and point out what Carlson is getting at, what specifically he is, excuse me, saying uh, with regards uh, to this view. This view is the idea that uh, Matthew, uh, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, the, the, the Matean ed- evangelist, was um, ethnically not Jewish, that he was probably uh, he, he was he was probably Roman and he did not know and did not understand the Hebrew Bible. Uh, that's quite specifically what uh, what Stephen Carlson is getting at. He's prom- promoting the 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 much more common idea, uh, and this is my this is where I would fall on this as well. Uh, the much more common idea is that the the author of the Gospel of Matthew is almost certainly a Hellenized Jew. Um, the difficulty with that is determining uh, how. You know what level of of interest and um, knowledge and um, care and introspection Matthew possesses with regards to his Jewishness, and it is a bit of an open question. So, just for the sake of clarity, before we continue, so it just seems like Dr. Ehrman just didn't look at a lot of the scholarship around this whole issue in Matthew twenty one about. <laughs> Is he saying that Jesus rode two donkeys or not? Uh, it doesn't seem like Ehrman is aware of a lot of the scholarship. And we're going to see more of that as I play more of this video, where Dr. Ehrman just seems to be unaware that Matthew was quite familiar with Hebrew parallelism. In the very video that Dr. Ehrman is responding to, I cited scholars like Bernard Batto 
showing that Matthew was quite proficient in uh, quite proficient in Hebrew uh, grammar, Hebrew parallelism, these kinds of things. So, all right, that's where we're going to stop it for now. So, um, where am I? Getting lost here, people. Okay, so. Um, yeah, uh, I I just want to point out here, uh, for starters, as a scholar, um, I may not, especially when I'm speaking off the cuff, if I'm just doing a live interview, I think I saw, yeah, I just wanted to make sure, good to see you, Paul, um, I we're we're discussing your uh, your interview with the uh, with uh, Professor Bart Ehrman, if you were unaware. Uh, so, if I'm speaking off the cuff, I may or may not mention every scholarly article or paper or commentary on a subject that I've ever read. Um, in fact. I probably am not going to do that. Is Bart woefully ignorant of the scholarship here? Or could it be that he's just not convinced by it and doesn't feel the need to bring it up and address it because he's satisfied with uh, with his position and with his answers, particularly in just this, this little, you know, 10 minute clip that uh, that he's working off here. All right. So at this point, I'm going to um, bring up my presentation. And for this, I'm going to have to shut off uh, my entire screen. So I am sorry for that entire screen. There we go. Um, and again, that means I'm not really going to be able to see what's going on in the comments here. Let's bring this up. So importantly, and this is really the critical key point here uh, that never really gets addressed by Michael in uh, in his talk here. Uh, he he kind of hand waves at this, you know, in his video. Some of this doesn't really, I think, get uh, adequately addressed by some of the commentators on this either. I was a little surprised when I read Stephen Carlson's articles that he didn't dwell on this issue uh, a lot more. And that is this fact. Uh, it's very, very important for the writer of the Gospel of Matthew that there are two donkeys in this story and not just one. Um, if you look at uh, these stories side by side, and I have this terrific color-coded graphic here, which was provided to me by my friend uh, Stephen Nelson. He was part of this uh, chat thread that I was involved in. He actually put this together for a presentation uh, that he did with uh, Derek Lambert and uh, Myth Vision uh, concerning this very issue. So he's got here uh, good English translations. I believe these are his own good English translations of all three passages. Uh, Mark 11, 2 to 7 is the original, and then both Luke. 1930 to 35 and Matthew 21 2 to 7 are reading and basically interpreting Mark here. You will notice as as you see this Luke is very close, consistently close to Mark. Basically just just copies him almost verbatim, just changing uh massaging a little bit of the wording here and there. Uh, importantly, Matthew is also following Mark very closely. You'll notice here right at the beginning of the story, Mark says, go to the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there that has never been written. Matthew repeats almost exactly, uh, and this is the case in the Greek, he repeats almost exactly in the Greek what Mark says. Go to the village ahead of you right away. You will find, he makes this very important change, a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Um, Mark continues, untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it. What does Matthew do? He copies almost exactly the text of Mark, but makes a very significant change. Untie them, 
bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you are to say, the Lord needs them. Do you see what he's doing here? And notice where the antecedents are. Notice the placement of these, these pronouns. Matthew is intentionally replacing the single colt with a colt and a donkey. And he's so indicating this with uh up, you know, with with uh changing the uh the the sorry, the singular um pronouns it to them to indicate that there's more than just one animal here. Mark continues, The Lord needs it and will send it back here soon. So they went and found a colt tied at a door outside the street and untied it. Some people standing there said to them, What are you doing? Untying the colt. And you'll see here too, I'm, I'm not going to go through Luke. You can look at that on your own, but it, it follows very, very closely. And here, is where Matthew makes another significant change. What does he say? The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Tell the people of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, unassuming and seated on adult. Oh, I, I said adult, didn't I? I did say that. Whoops. Uh, no, not adult. Uh, your king is coming to you unassuming and seated on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see what's going on here? So Matthew has found basically the repetition of the story uh, in Mark about the the you know the the disciples basically doing what Jesus told them to do and things happening exactly the way he said they would happen he's replaced that bit with this this is a filled according to this scripture and then he quotes um a version and we're going to go deep into this uh in a bit but he quotes a version of Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 okay let's continue uh, so what are you doing untying the colt? They replied as Jesus told them, and the bystanders let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw on it their cloaks, and he sat on it. What does Matthew do? Um, he says, so the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Very important here. Look at this in these uh, in this last sentence, where Matthew is replacing the pronouns. Okay, that's really, really key, because the pronouns, the singular pronouns in Mark, refer to the animal. They refer to the colt. When Matthew replaces those pronouns with the plural, he's fault like he is following the text basically verbatim. And all he's doing is making this single change, one animal to two animals in all these instances. So uh, very important. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, pull this up. Uh, one of the things that uh, that happens in this story in Mark and Luke, I've got the Greek text up here. They're absolutely consistent on this, that the animal is, um, uh, sorry, it's a polos, which we translate as a cult. Uh, here you have the word in Mark 11.2 in 1930, you will find a cult tied there. It's repeated again in Luke. Here again in verses 4 and 5, they found a colt. What are you doing untying the colt? And once more in verses 7 and verse 35, they brought the colt, throwing their cloaks on the colt. So this is the only word for an animal that actually appears in both Mark and and Luke in this story. And this is the significant difference. Look at Matthew. You will find uh, an onos uh, tied there and a polos or a colt with her. Did I? Uh, yeah, I did translate that, didn't I? Oh, yeah, okay. And then again in verse 7, they brought the donkey 
that's the onos, uh, onon in in uh, the Greek because that's in the accusative, and the colt, polon, also in the accusative, and they placed on them their cloaks. I hope you see what Matthew's doing here. And in my opinion, this is the most important part of what, well, no, it is. It's the most important part of what Matthew's doing to this story. So I'm going to pull this chart up again here, this uh, this wonderful table that Stephen made. Matthew's made these, these deliberate changes, and there's two of them. First of all, instead of one animal, there is two. Instead of just the polos, the colt, and this is a masculine noun, there is now a donkey or a draft animal, um, an onos, uh, onon in this case, which can be either masculine or feminine. Uh, but I think Matthew also makes clear that the onos is feminine by referring to her as her a couple of times in the same story. Uh, and then he also notes that uh, the colt seems to be her offspring. He, she, he, he calls the colt uh, literally the son of Hupozugion, uh, or um, son of the donkey. And the, the, the donkey here is a, is a neuter noun. And this is almost certainly with reference back to the Onos. And then the second important change that uh, Matthew has made in this story, he's included this prophecy from Zechariah. So right away, I'm going to say my temptation at the outset is to say that the fixation on whether or not the, the circus image, the, the Jesus riding the two donkeys, I think at the outset that is a bit of a red herring because the critical point here is that Matthew thinks there are two animals here, and this is distinctly different from what's happening in Mark. And importantly, because Matthew thinks there's two animals here, this raises legitimate questions about his familiarity with Hebrew parallelism. And we're going to get into that. Bart introduced to you the idea of Hebrew poetic parallelism, where you have uh, the the way Hebrew poetry usually works is that you will you will have uh, repeating statements, uh, basically expressing the same idea. So in the Zechariah passage that uh, that Matthew quotes in the in the Hebrew, it talks about there being a um, a, a donkey or a draft animal who is then specified in the next cola as um, uh, a, a a son of um, uh, donkeys, or what I think is is legitimately understood or interpreted as, you know, a young animal. So uh, that's really important. Now, I will say, and and this this came up in our in our chat thread. I made this point. I'm like, I I just really think that that all this attention fixed to whether or not Jesus is riding the two animals is detracting from this important issue, which is that for Matthew, there's two, and only for Matthew, and he seems very very concerned that everyone knows there's two animals and there's only one in all the other versions of this story. That's critical. Stephen, I think, rightly noted, though, that no, like, there's more going on here. Because when you look at the antecedents, uh, the way that the, the, the way that Matthew so closely follows Mark, and then you look at the places where he has made the changes he has to the text, how he has corrected the pronouns in the text, it seems obvious that Jesus was sitting on the two of them. And that is the case that I'm going to make uh, moving forward here. So uh, finally, before we move on to the next part of um, uh, Michael's video, uh, I just want to bring up, because we're going to spend the next bit uh, talking about this, which is Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah 9.9, 9, which Matthew quotes, um, and there is the Hebrew version of this prophecy, there is a Greek translation that appears in the Septuagint, and then there's 
Matthew's version of this prophecy and what on earth is he doing with it? So here's the Hebrew. You'll notice, I, it doesn't matter if you can't read any of this, it's, it's okay. Um, you can see in the structure that I have divided it into six individual lines. These represent uh, three sets of uh, parallel pairs, and uh, the same structure is preserved in the Septuagint. You can also see that Matthew is doing something quite differently. This is my translation of the Hebrew, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout out, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. Righteous and saving is he, humble and sitting on a mule, on a donkey, foaled by draft animals. What does the Septuagint do? He follows it almost perfectly, um, almost extre like extremely literally until we get towards the end here. And I'll, I'll point that out. What does he say? Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout out, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. Righteous and saving is he, gentle and sitting on a donkey. And then he does this thing on the last line gentle and sitting on a donkey, and a new colt. Now, I think it's an open question here about whether or not the translator of this particular passage is trying to preserve the parallel in this final pair. You can see he clearly understands what's going on with the other ones, but in this final one, it could be you could read this as you know a uh a, a preservation of the parallel structure but uh not necessarily it's a little ambiguous you can look at the septuagint text and say is there one or two donkeys here look at that he's gentle and sitting on a donkey and on a new colt or sorry and a new colt the the on is not there Okay, but we'll we'll get into this for a little bit. Also, I wanted to point out the the word that he's used to translate uh, "humble." There is is a pretty important change that we will talk about in a minute. Look at what Matthew does. Say to the daughters of Zion, "What on earth is that?" Like that's not what is written in the Septuagint text. Well. That's actually uh, the Septuagint version of Isaiah 62, verse 11. And then he skips uh, the second part of the first parallel and continues. See, your king is coming to you. It's a verbatim quotation of the Septuagint. And then he skips the next cola. Um, he, he, he just skips right over righteous and saving in he and says, gentle and sitting on not a donkey, but on a draft animal. He's following the Septuagint very closely right up until this, uh, this last animal. And then in the, the final clause, and on a colt, the son of a donkey. All right. So um, I think that's, that's it for the first part. Um, yep, I think so. I just want to make those points crystal clear again. We're already 45 minutes into this. This is going to take forever, but that's okay. Uh, hope you guys have the stamina to stick it out. Um, the close comparison of Matthew to Mark strongly suggests that Matthew did have Jesus sitting on both donkeys. This is the natural way to read this text. This is the source critical way of reading this text. So um, I'm going to stop sharing that. And we're going to go back to the video at this point. Maybe I'll hit some of your questions as we go through. Um, Michael Beverly, he's agreeing with Rob. Let's be friends. Let's keep building bridges. Let's get going. Hi, Kip. Hi, Michael. It's always good to see you. Um, what's next? Q, in short, does the Bible allow abortion? IP holds a sign and lies about the Hebrew of Numbers 5, 11 to 31. If you have time, watch it on here. Like, um, yeah, I, 
uh, sorry, I don't know anything about it. Um, but I am unsurprised if uh, if Michael is is making points from the language that he doesn't understand. So it's it's something that he is wont to do. Uh, but thank you very much, Q. Thank you, Michael Beverly, for your uh, for your super chats. We're going to continue with the video. Um, wow, there are 265 people watching. I think that's the most people I've ever had uh, watching a live stream of mine. That's pretty It's pretty wild. I'm feeling kind of special, guys. I'm not going to lie. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, let's move on here with uh, the second part of uh michael jones's discussion where he gets into this question about the languages what is what is matthew reading craig keener says as in i hope everyone Palestine, can hear it let me know if you can hear it please on which jesus sat across both the mother and the cult although jesus would write only one the them on which he sat could mean the garments in other words Given the festive nature of the event, it would be expected both animals would be covered in garments. The mother was there to keep the okay. young cold calm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that even evangelicals like Craig Keener can be stupid too. <laughs> I, I don't think Dr. Ehrman really understood the argument. Uh, Craig Keener's not agreeing with Dr. Ehrman. He's not saying, if, if you read his commentary, that Matthew says Jesus rode two donkeys. He's saying the cloaks were spread on both because of the festive nature of the event, and Jesus just obviously sat on one. So, but importantly, and something that Michael doesn't ever really get into, there are two of them. And in Matthew, it's the only place where there are two of them. There is only one animal in Mark. There's only one in Luke. There's only one in John. Matthew is the only place where there are two of them. I mean, if we just go back and look at the quote, as in later Palestine, one would drape the garments on which Jesus sat across both the mother and the colt, although Jesus would ride only one. The them on which he sat could mean the garments. So I, I don't know why Bart Ehrman associated himself with Craig Keener. He's not. So, and, and I'm going to point this out too. I don't like this argument uh, that uh, Jesus was just sitting on the garments as opposed to the two animals because of the way the antecedents function in how they're replacing the text of Mark that Matthew is basically copying directly. Um, it just doesn't work. Uh saying that jesus rode both there but that was a very weird comment uh but yeah uh some more interesting stuff though is coming up and matthew gets the key section of the quote from the hebrew and not okay really quick this is the most important part this is why it's very unlikely matthew says jesus remember guys this is the most important part this rode two donkeys this is something i bring up in my video matthew is clearly aware of the hebrew because he doesn't have a perfect correspondence between the quote from Zechariah and what he says in his narrative. Because in the quote from Zechariah, it mentions two male donkeys if you're going to take it literally and not understand the Hebrew parallelism. Okay. Matthew says, however, that a they brought him a mother and it's and it's full. Okay. So that could not that does not correspond to a literal reading of the passage in Zechariah. And Matthew gets the key section of the quote from the Hebrew and not merely from the Greek Septuagint. This is important because in the Hebrew passage Matthew knows about and quotes from, the Hebrew word for donkey is masculine. But in the narrative of verse 7, the word for donkey is presented with a feminine article. So between the quote and the narrative, there is not a perfect correspondence. Matthew. I won't be surprised if you didn't follow that. Um, and it's not because you can't make sense of this for a lay audience. It's because I don't think, I really don't think Michael fully understands the argument that he's trying to make. So in my opinion, he kind of butchers it. And it's not clear to me. I I had to watch this section several times just to see how he's making this connection on the basis of the language 
as a means to say Matthew is actually quoting the Hebrew as opposed to uh, the Greek. And yeah, it's 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 hard to follow. Matthew seems aware that Zechariah was speaking about a male donkey, since it is clear in his narration, the other animal was a female, breaking the direct link with the quoted passage. <laughs> Whoa, that's out there. <laughs> and I am not surprised that Bart Ehrman watched what what Paul clipped for him there and went, what the hell is going on? Because what Michael says in that little section of his video does not make a lot of sense. And we'll we'll show what's I will show you why that is. I think it's weird that Ehrman's response to a lot of these is just sort of to laugh and make comments, but not really respond. You'll see what I mean. Here we go. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm not looking at the Hebrew here, but I'm just saying. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, no, that's that. Yeah, that that that's so okay. I look, I'd have so guys. The other thing I need to point out here is is Michael's facial expressions. And this is one of the things I, I really have a problem with in this video is he's making these like wah kind of crazy facial expressions like 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 Ehrman is just is is just missing something completely obvious here. This obvious point that's being made. And uh uh the crazy thing about this, the thing that I I I don't like about this is just how disrespectful it is. For a guy like Inspiring Philosophy who does not have a good grasp, I don't even think he has a grasp of the ancient languages to be to be responding this way. He has no idea what the argument even is. I, do, I don't think he does. He, he, he doesn't seem... If he knows it, he does a terrible job of expressing it, but it's just... Uh, it's 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 really it's it's disrespectful it's super disrespectful in particular to a guy like bart ehrman um who has <laughs> written textbooks on uh the uh the the new testament and on uh the the manuscripts and on textual criticism Come on. They have to look at the Hebrew. It sounds okay. like a, fair enough. It sounds like an incredible stretch to me. <laughs> but it, it's not an incredible stretch, stretch, Dr. Ehrman. I'm literally just citing what m several modern scholars have said, like Robert Gundry, Bernard Batto, Stephen Carlson. Like, again, it just. So, as we shall see, yes, Michael is citing modern scholars who are taking. Uh, various positions in opposition to, I think, the the larger point being made by by Bart Ehrman uh, via John Meyer. But I am not convinced that Michael is representing them clearly. It just seems like Dr. Ehrman is just woefully ignorant of a lot of the scholarship surrounding this issue of Matthew. But Matthew's not reading it in Hebrew. Matthew doesn't isn't never he doesn't quote the hebrew bible he quotes the greek translation and so what the hebrew has to do with it i don't know <laughs> okay this is exactly what i wanted to get to okay he's saying that matthew just quoted the greek and that's why he got two donkeys out of zechariah 9 9 no that's just false and i can just you don't have to take my word for it let me just pull do you hear the confidence there do you hear the assertion Matthew was quoting from the Hebrew. Michael's presenting this like this is established. Let's pull up some actual scholars here. Again, Dr. Ehrman, it just seems very much unaware of a lot of the scholarship around this issue. Craig Keener says that Matthew translates from the Hebrew more literally than the Septuagint does. When Matthew was writing chapter 21 about the prophecy of the, of the donkey, he is not quoting from the Septuagint. Dr. Ehrman is just wrong here. Okay? Robert Gundry, it is very clear from Matthew's disagreement with the Septuagint in this quotation that he had the Hebrew text before him. Bernard Batto, that the evangelist did not understand the intended parallelism of the prophetic text seems highly unlikely, however. Already in this verse alone, Matthew has twice felt free to admit one of the two members of Parallel Kola, daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem. 
triumphant and victorious, humble and riding on a draft animal. Clearly, Matthew understood Hebrew poetic parallelism. I'm going to back this up just a little bit so you can see that quote. Um, but I would say this is this is very much uh, a matter of dispute. I am not certain that Matthew understands Hebrew parallelism. He might. Um, but I don't think you can establish that sense based on his uh, um, citation of uh, Zechariah nine nine. Uh, and I'll just I'll just bring this up quickly. I'll I'll get into it a little bit in a bit. But this uh, this point that that Bernard Battle is making, I think is a it's a pretty weak one, uh, in my opinion. Basically, what what Battle is suggesting is that because Remember, I said that the text is divided into these into these three uh, these three pairs, right? Of of two uh, parallel cola. Uh, Bernard Battle is saying that in the first two, Matthew just just combines or cites the the one, showing that he understands that both cola are saying the same thing. That's an assumption. And I will bring up some ideas with regards to what I think Matthew's doing in his citation of those parts of the text, which I think actually demonstrate that he is dependent on the Septuagint, and he may not understand Hebrew parallelism. Matthew understood Hebrew poetic parallelism. Okay. Again, Robert Gundry, it is therefore not unreasonable to suppose uh, that Matthew was working with a genuine historical tradition. Matthew emphasizes the presence of the mother animal, not to equate her with the masculine donkey in the quotation from Zechariah, but to underscore that the young donkey really was, as Mark says, unused. I like at this point, I feel like it's uh, some of this is 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 Michael just pulling up uh, quotations that uh, that appear to agree with his position, but on don't necessarily relate uh, exactly. I think Gundry makes an interesting point here. One of the reasons why, remember, the, the big question here is why on earth are there two animals in Matthew and only one in every other tradition? And moreover, why is Matthew so determined to make sure everyone knows that there's two animals here? Uh Gundry suggests maybe because Matthew's right. Maybe the issue is that there actually were two animals and he's the one who's got the the most historically reliable tradition. And I I'll I'll say I think that's that's certainly a legitimate idea. Um I don't I don't buy it. I think there's other reasons why um, Matthew wants two animals in his version of the story, but at least Gundry is positing something that that makes some some good sense to me. And I don't think that this fits very well with the point that Michael wants to make about the Hebrew text. So here's the point. Okay, even if you read D so uh, and I'll just say this, if you look at this quote here, uh, the the point that Gundry is making is that uh, because the the one animal is female and the other animal is male in uh, uh, Matthew's narrative, it's that there's two animals and it's that one is female and the other is male. And and he's he's suggesting that this you could maybe draw some of this out from the uh the hebrew text as opposed to the uh the the greek um i am doubtful but we shall see right ew davies and uh dale allison's commentary on matthew even they acknowledge matthew was not quoting from the greek here matthew was quoting from the hebrew text of zechariah notice also i'm want you to 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 pay close attention to this Notice also the difference in the level of confidence that these scholars are expressing these ideas compared to what Michael says. Michael says that uh, Dale Allison and W.D. Davies, who wrote a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew back in 
uh, the, the mid to late 80s. Uh, he says they even acknowledge that Matthew is not reading from the Septuagint, that he's reading from a Hebrew text. Well, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. When they talk about this issue, they talk about how Matthew's quotation does not align with the Septuagint, and it kind of looks like it could be a quotation of the Hebrew, but then they very carefully also point out that this could still be a Greek version of the text that Matthew is reading. It's these sorts of nuances and this sort of care in language, in the expression of our positions that really distinguishes scholars from apologists. For Dr. Ehrman just to assert that Matthew was just quoting from the Greek is just blatantly wrong. And numerous scholars have pointed this out. It's not just me. I'm getting this from the actual scholars. I mean, even Dale Allison and Davies acknowledge this. Dr. Ehrman just seems woefully unaware of this. And he's teaching a co course on Matthew, and he doesn't know this. It's kind of confusing. It seems like his whole argument that Matthew says that Jesus rode two donkeys, it comes from this theory he heard from a Catholic scholar. He didn't check a lot of the scholarship around it, and then he just asserted it as if this was a fact, and he didn't engage with a lot of the scholarship showing that, no, Matthew was aware of the Hebrew. He did know Hebrew parallelism in poetry. He was not just making a huge error here, or he was not just forcing it to be literal. He was quite aware. It seems more likely, as Gundry says, the reason why the mother is mentioned is to specify the same thing that Mark does, that the donkey was unused and young. It's not being brought so that Jesus could sit on both of them here. So it just seems like Dr. Ehrman is just woefully unaware of the scholarship surrounding this issue, unfortunately. He's just, I mean, I don't know how to say it. He's just flat out wrong. Numerous scholars have noted that when Matthew wrote chapter 21, he was quoting from a Hebrew version of Zechariah, not a Greek version. You catch that, everyone? I hope everyone caught that. According to Michael Jones, uh, Bart Ehrman is just flat out wrong here. Uh, Matthew was quoting from the Hebrew. This is established. This has been established by numerous scholars. Again, listen to the certitude, listen to the confidence, the very unearned confidence. Michael doesn't know these languages. He's not reading the text and making these evaluations for himself. He's looking at men who do know what they're doing, and they're making good arguments for the points. Well, I, I mean, they're making arguments for the points they're making. Some of them are better than others, uh, but it's very much an open question. This is not something that I would say is settled. This question of whether or not Matthew is reading the Hebrew Bible or whether he's reading a Greek version. And at that point, I think it's it's time to, to get into this issue. I'm going to uh, go back to my presentation here. Okay, guys. Uh, holy smokes. There's 314 people watching. That's ridiculous. Okay. Um, I got to share my whole screen again. I will. I promise I've noticed a, a few super chats come in. I will get to those uh, after this section before we move on to the next one. Thanks, guys. Is everyone having a good time? I hope everyone is uh, enjoying the stream. Maybe give me a post a number one or a yes or a cheers if you're enjoying the stream so far. Should I continue? I'm going to anyways. You don't have a choice. All right. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay. Remember what Matt, what Michael said, and I, I was careful to, um, unfortunately, there I couldn't find a transcription for this video. It's super annoying to me when I can't find transcriptions for videos, so I actually had to type this out by hand, but I, I think this is accurate. He says, Matthew is clearly aware of the Hebrew because he doesn't have a perfect correspondence between the quote from Zechariah and what he says in his narrative. Because in the quote from Zechariah, it mentions two male donkeys, if you're going to take it literally and not understand the Hebrew parallelism. Matthew says, however, that they brought him a mother and it's full, so that does not 
correspond to a literal reading of the passage in Zechariah. See, I, I just think he's confused here. Like, I, I think I understand the argument he's trying to mount, but I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's not clear. Uh, from this, because a lot of this doesn't make any sense here. It almost looks like he's saying there's two male donkeys in the text. Yes, there's two male donkeys in the Hebrew text and in. Oh, wait, no, one of them. So one of them is neuter in the uh, in the Septuagint. But in the Hebrew text, there's two male donkeys. But then he says uh, one of them is female and that somehow indicates that Matthew understands the Hebrew parallelism because it doesn't correspond to a literal reading of Zechariah. If somebody sees something different here, please let me know, because I I am struggling to understand the point Michael is making. I don't get it. Uh, But at this point, I want to talk about what's happening in the text, okay? So first of all, uh in the septuagint the first animal now let's talk we're going to start by talking about genders okay within hebrew there are two genders there is every word is either masculine or it's feminine there is no neuter gender this is a difference uh in the greek there are three genders um and so quite often what you'll you'll find in greek translations of the hebrew bible is they will use this neutral this neutral uh neuter gender uh to reflect their understanding and in an interpretation excuse me of the text it's a way also of contemporizing the text as well so uh here's what we have uh, in Zechariah 9.9, 9, the this little G here that you see on your screen, that's the um uh so so that's the uh the the standard uh symbol for the Septuagint, uh the Greek translation. So this is this is from the Septuagint version. Um he has uh epihupozugion, and this is a neuter noun on a donkey. When Matthew Uh, translates this particular part of the passage, he has changed the gender there uh, with the word honos, epionon, is what Matthew says literally, on a draft animal. And it can be either masculine or feminine, but I think it's it's feminine based on uh, the the way that Matthew describes the animal elsewhere in his narrative and also with how uh, the the following term corresponds to it. So then uh, in in the second stick um, uh, of of the passage, there is a, a polos, a new colt. This is a, a young donkey. This is again in uh, in the um, uh, sorry in the accusative, and the animal is masculine. I hope I hope you guys appreciate the color coding here, right? So green is neuter. Uh, the the pale blue is feminine. The yellow is masculine. So uh, and this corresponds. Uh, to what we see in Matthew 21, 5. He's got epipolon. It's the exact same phrase. It's also masculine. But then he's added this uh, a little bit at the end. Epihuion uh, uh Now, he's he's got uh, son of a donkey. Son is a masculine noun. Uh, the donkey is the same word as from the first, uh, the first stick in uh, the Septuagint version of Zechariah nine nine, it's just a slightly different form because it's in the genitive, not in the accusative, and we can tell that from the ending. But it is exactly the same word, and here it's neuter. Uh, Hupazugion occurs a lot in the uh, Septuagint translation, and as far as I know, it's always neuter. Um, I'm happy to be corrected on that, but I believe it's always neuter. So. Uh, basically, I just want to point out that Matthew's already doing a lot of things with the the genders of the animals. So how does that 
compare to what's taking place in the Hebrew. Uh, this is Zechariah 9 9 from the Masoretic text. The, the Gothic M there is the symbol for the Masoretic text. He's got Al, uh, sorry, Al Chamor, which is on a mule. This is masculine. And he's got Al Ayir on a donkey. And that is also masculine. And then he specifies that this Ayir is a Ben Atonot, uh, literally a son of draft animals. So the first word is masculine. Again, it's a son. Uh, the second word, uh, Atonot, is feminine plural. So it's not just an an, uh, anota, uh, which would be the feminine singular. This is atonot. It's a feminine plural. So w based on just the what, what Matthew's doing with these animals, um, is he quoting from the Hebrew or the Greek? I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, this requires a deeper dive. So we're going to look stick by stick at uh, how Matthew handles this whole prophecy in Zechariah 9, uh, verse 9. Uh, one of the things I want to point out um, about this particular passage with, with uh, Matthew's translation of it is that, guys, there is just way too many words in both Greek and Hebrew for donkey or mule or ass or colt. Uh, and honestly, I think that's part of the problem here. Uh, there's a lot of synonyms at work, and it, it, it creates more confusion than, than clarity. That's for sure. All right, so here is the Hebrew text of Zechariah 9.9. 9. I've put right beside it the Septuagint text of Zechariah 9.9, and we're just going to go through each of these sticks individually, starting with the first one. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout out, daughter of Jerusalem. The Greek text there matches it basically word for word. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout out, daughter of Jerusalem. Matthew 21.5 says, say unto the daughters of Zion. So this is completely different. I have marked places where Matthew has departed completely from both the Septuagint and from the Hebrew in this, this light blue color. Um, and this is, uh, this is one of these places. So what he's doing here is instead of quoting these first two stikos, from Zechariah 9.9, he has decided to quote from the Septuagint version of Isaiah 62.11, and this is a verbatim quote from the Septuagint, say to the daughters of Zion, all right? So right away, he's made a significant change, but importantly, he's made a change using the text, the Greek text of the Septuagint, all right? In the next sticko, see, your king is coming to you, righteous and saving is he. The Greek follows it exactly. See, your king is coming to you, righteous and saving is he. What does Matthew do? See, your king is coming to you, matches exactly, exactly, word for word, the Septuagint text of this, and then. Um, eliminates this second stick. Now, before we move on, you'll remember uh, I mentioned uh, Michael brought up that that quote from the article by Bernard Bato about how we know Matthew understands Hebrew parallelism because for these first two stikos, instead of preserving the parallel, he's just summarizing both of them in a single statement. That's how we know he understands the Hebrew parallelism. Well. I am not convinced by that, and here's why. Look at this first stiko. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout out, daughter of Jerusalem. Now, if you understand Hebrew poetic parallelism, you look at this and you recognize that both of these are with reference to the same person. There is only one daughter of Jerusalem or Zion. It's the same figure. What does Matthew do? You will say 
to the daughters of Zion. Do you see what's going on there? I think it's obvious. And this suggests to me maybe Matthew doesn't understand or at least doesn't care about Hebrew parallelism because he has combined the pairs in a way that suggests he thinks there's two daughters here. Do you see that? And then for the next one, uh, this is a this is um, a point that Stephen Carlson has made. He suggested that uh, this second phrase, uh, tzaddik v'noshahu, uh, righteous and saving in sea, which was translated by the Septuagint, uh, dikaios kai sozon autos, uh, righteous and saving is he? It's it's exactly the same. Stephen Carlson suggested that this uh, word uh, nosha, which is uh, the Hebrew word that uh, we translate as uh, saving, appears. It's the form of it is something called the nifal. In Hebrew, the nifal stem is used to indicate passive forms. So you look at that and you think, well, the the proper translation of that would actually be being saved, not savior, um, not the saving one, but the saved. The problem with that argument is that uh, this particular word occurs only in two stems. It occurs in the nifal and it occurs in the hifal. So it occurs in what would ordinarily be the passive form and then in what we think of as the causative form. And there is some ambiguity here in terms of how the Hebrew Bible uses these particular stems with these particular words. And this is something that you only know if you understand the languages. So where the nifal appears in a few places in the Hebrew Bible, it does have this active sense that he's the saving one. And in fact, I, I haven't looked but uh, at all of them, but in all the uh, English translations of this passage that I've seen, they all translate it like this, that he's the righteous saving one. In fact, this is how the Septuagint translator translated it, and he seems to understand the parallelism just fine, that he's the saving one. So uh, Carlson has suggested that this is the reason why Matthew left it out, because, because he didn't want uh, Jesus to be presented as, you know, uh, passively being saved by Yahweh, so better just to eliminate that. And I don't buy that at all for, you know, for he's saying this is how we know he's reading the Hebrew text as opposed to the Greek, right? I don't buy that for a minute um, because of what I just said about the way that this word can be translated in Hebrew, but also because I think Matthew's program actually fits very well with why he would eliminate this passage. Part of what Matthew is, is at great pains to convey is that Jesus is humble. And this helps to reinforce his point if he's not the saving one in this particular in this particular point in his ministry he's entering Jerusalem as the humble king all right i uh, hope that's relatively clear to people let's move on um why aren't we moving on okay uh Septuagint uh so f sorry the uh, Hebrew text says humble and sitting on a mule on a donkey the son of draft animals the Septuagint translates gentle and sitting on a donkey and a new colt. Again, I'll point this out. Uh, there's a couple of important changes here that the Septuagint translator has made to the Hebrew text. He's translated on ni, which ordinarily means poor, uh, can mean humble. He's translated this with a Greek word, praus which means gentle. Um, now, this is, this is really significant, I think, okay? So, the word ani in the Hebrew Bible occurs 80 times. I went, I looked, I counted them all. Uh, in those 80 occurrences, it's almost always translated by two different Greek words. It's either translated by patochos, which means poor, or with tapainos, which means humble. Okay. That's not what appears here. Uh, 
The Greek translator of this text in the Septuagint used praus, which means gentle. Significantly, this word is translated with praus only three times. Out of those 80 times, it's translated with praus only three times. And this suggests to me, because look what's going on here. What does Matthew do? He uses praus. So if Matthew is translating directly from the Hebrew, he's not going to use that word. He's going to use something else. He's going to use something like patokos or like tapainos. He's not going to use praus. He copies verbatim the text of the Septuagint up to this point at the end where he makes this change. Instead of uh, the the king, uh, instead of the king sitting on a donkey on a on a huposukion, he's sitting on an onas, on a draft animal. Remember, this is this is feminine. It can be masculine or feminine, but it's feminine in this instance. And then he makes this pretty significant change from the Septuagint. Uh, it kind of that's I, I. You see what I did there? I put the little thingy there to show it almost matches the Septuagint, but not quite. So uh, he is gentle and sitting on a on a giraffe animal on a colt, the son of a donkey. Now look at the Hebrew here. He's sitting on a donkey, the son of draft animals. That looks pretty close. And I'm going to suggest to you that's really at the heart of why a number of commentators have looked at this passage and said, wow, you know, that last sticko kind of looks like what's in the Hebrew Bible. Here, he says, Kahepi polon huion huposugio, and on a colt, son of a donkey. So I have shown you with the, with the yellow there exactly those parts of this quotation that look pretty similar to what's taking place in the Hebrew. And then, of course, he makes this other change where he, he, he changes uh, the, the third animal in here, the uh, atonot or the, um, the draft animals to huposugion, uh, to a donkey. Um, importantly, it's, uh, it's neuter and it's singular. In the Hebrew, it's feminine and it's plural. In the Greek, it's masculine and it's singular. So he's doing a whole bunch of different things here with this text. All right. So what's going on in that last, in that last clause? Uh, we're not sure why. Do scholars like uh, W.D. Davies and um, Dale Allison or Keener and Robert Gundry suggest that Matthew translates from the Hebrew more literally than the Septuagint does? So that was Keener's statement. Davies and Allison say he follows the MT as opposed to the Septuagint. I am going to suggest to you that it has everything to do with just this um, just this, this, this last bit here, um, of this, uh, of this passage, uh, that it looks pretty close, uh, to what appears in the Masoretic text in the Hebrew. Um, so there is a case to be made there that for at least for, for at best, I would say just this last bit of this quotation from Zechariah 9.9 9, looks like it's it's close to the Masoretic text. But significantly, and this is something that you can't really get past, the entire rest of the passage matches the Septuagint basically word for word uh, until those points where, where Matthew has made uh, deliberate changes to promote his own narrative about there being two animals and Jesus' triumphal entry. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I've got, uh, so yeah, I've got, uh, I've got the one more section. I will, um, where am I here? Oh, I have to, I have to, oh no, I lost my cursor guys. I can't find it. Okay. Um, so 
I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to this for a second. Okay, I'm going to pull up uh, a bunch more of your super chats and get to those. Um, all right. Uh, Corda Hill. Um, actually, uh, Corda Hill, if you could, if you don't mind sticking around, I'd like to hold off on this until the end and get through uh, the text first. So just, uh, just, just hold tight. Um, let's see. If, I think this one's probably relevant. Does the reliance on the Septuagint by early canonical New Testament authors, editors, imply bias that they had to Greek culture, language, thought as superior? I would say uh, I don't think you can you can uh, say they thought it was superior. I think for the most part, it's because they were thoroughly Hellenized. Um, you know whether or not. Uh, Paul and Matthew and Mark were Jewish, which I think is an open question. I know a lot of people uh, disagree. I, I think it's an open question, particularly for a couple of them, if not at minimally one of them. Um, it, it, uh, if, if that's the case, then um, uh, no, I, I don't think it's, it's a matter of superiority of culture. I think uh, it, it could be a few things. It's very possible that even uh, Second Temple Jews, Hellenized Jews, depending on where they're living, may not have the best grasp of Hebrew. It's very possible that, uh, I mean, the reason the Septuagint was written in the first place was because there were so many Jews who could no longer read the Hebrew. Um, who were still, you know, they were still Jewish. They're still practicing the rituals. They're still attending the synagogues. They're still observing the festivals and the Sabbath and all this stuff. Um, as a result, you know, I, I think it's quite possible that the same holds for the, uh, the writers of uh, the New Testament. Um, I don't think this has to do with a bias. Uh, I think this has mostly to do with just the text that they had access to. Thanks for the, thank you very much for the, uh, the super chat though. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, oh, don't, for, don't forget to remind everyone to like the stream. Hopefully this small donations helps fund your next purchase from Braille. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thank you for all you do. Also don't sell yourself short, Dr. Kip. I've seen your streams crack 200. Yeah, but that was, that was like, 250 dude i'd never seen anything like that thank you so much jay-z for the very generous donation i will be sure to put that to use i'll probably need like 10 more of those before i can afford to buy a braille book but every little bit counts right uh right um thank you to beautiful joe where do i find your credentials dr kip um i mean they're on my wall over there. Uh, I have a PhD in religions and theology from the University of Manchester. I did my undergraduate and graduate work at Trinity Western University. I've held three postdocs, uh, two at Trinity Western University, one at the University of Achter. And uh, uh, yeah, I I mean, a lot of this stuff you can find, I, I, I haven't published my CV, I probably should. Uh, a lot of that stuff you can you can find on uh, on my academia page. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much for the super chat for the question. All right. Uh, Sentinel Apologetics. Thank you, Rob. Very generous today. Um, could Matthew have used whole for parts in a key out tone equals the parts of the whole epicathesen? Uh, uh, he was sitting on the whole as one of the parts, like the Iliad. Uh, Carpolamos de Hippon epibeseto. He mounted the horses. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Um, so this is the argument that Stephen Carlson makes with regards to this passage. I'm glad you brought it up, Rob. And this is potentially a possibility. I don't think it works, and I will explain why if you uh, if you hold on. Uh, I got one more here from uh, Glad to Be Gone. Thank you for the very generous super chat. Did translating the New Testament into Greek contribute to the New Testament becoming so popular? 
I'm new at this, so glad to be gone. Uh, scholars are by and large in agreement that virtually everything in the New Testament was originally written in Greek and was not translated from uh, a, a certainly not a Semitic language. There's been some question about how well some of the gospel authors like Mark uh, and Matthew in particular knew Aramaic, which would have been the vernacular, in uh, Roman Palestine at the time that these texts were written. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the, the fact that these texts were written entirely in Greek originally and not translated from a Semitic original, uh, this, uh, this has helped scholars understand uh, what these texts were and basically who they were written for. But it's a great question. Um, welcome. Welcome to my channel. And it's okay to be new. We all start somewhere, right? But it's it's all super fascinating stuff. Super interesting. Um, I hope everyone's still having fun. I have been going for an hour and a half and I wanted to get the uh <laughs> I wanted to get through Michael's stuff in an hour. I'm so naive. Um, let's have a drink, shall we? All right, I'm gonna have a drink. I hope everyone's having fun. I hope everyone's still with me. Uh, we are going to continue watching an Inspiring Philosophies video, and then we will wrap up what I think is happening here in the text. Uh, yeah, we're good to go. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> Furthermore, you should be able to hear it. Let me know if you can't hear it. Zachariah. Given that scholars like Craig Keener and Robert Gundry note elsewhere throughout his gospel, he displays knowledge of Hebrew and comprehensive knowledge of the scriptures. Even in this passage, yeah. Matthew translates from the Hebrew yeah. more literally than the Septuagint does. Yeah, I don't think there's much evidence that he was looking at the Hebrew generally. When you look at his quotations, it's pretty... Oh, God, it just drives me crazy when he shakes his head like that, like like Ehrman has just sound, said something unbelievably stupid. No, really, he hasn't, Michael. He really hasn't. Like, it's an open question. Um, when you look at the way that Matthew is, trans is, is handling scripture, he's got a real mixed bag. Of stuff he quotes from the Septuagint a lot, like directly. Lots of times, though, he's he's doing this really freeform paraphrastic thing, and it's difficult. It's difficult to tell what what uh, what his source texts look like. We'll get into this a little bit, okay? Pretty clear that he's not tempering his quotations by the Hebrew. He's he's going with the Greek in the places you can check. Well, no, I mean again, that's just false. I mean, if, if you look at the actual quote Matthew has, it doesn't match the Septuagint reading. And this is why scholars from Dale Allison, Davies, Gundry, Carlson have noted this stuff, that Matthew definitely was quoting from the Hebrew. So he would be aware. And if he's quoting from the Hebrew, that's important for one reason. One, because if you were going to take this quite, you would take the, the passage in Zechariah quite literally, you have to get two male donkeys. But Matthew says they brought a mother and a foal to Jesus. So he was reading that literally they have to bring two male donkeys and he doesn't say that also uh we can also take a look at some of the stuff Stephen carlson says here sorry i i'd like to point out here just before moving on that if matthew is reading from the hebrew text then there are still going to be two male donkeys so again two-part paper he wrote extensive on this and he covers a lot of the literature on this uh so again if you don't want to take my word or just read Carlson's paper where he covers a lot more scholarly takes on this, which unfortunately I just don't think Dr. Ehrman is aware of. He says okay, the double donkey reading of Zechariah 9 9 faces two major problems despite its appealing congruence with the donkey terms in the Matthew narrative. The first is that it requires a reading of the Hebrew and the Septuagint text that is divergent from Jewish reading practices, despite Matthew's interest in presenting a translation more closely mirroring the Hebrew form over the Septuagint. Matthew's concern for what the Hebrew says is at odds with the suggestion that it meant something else entirely to him. Second, the breaking of the parallelism of Zechariah 9.9 should generate two male donkeys. Same thing I just told you. But I'll help you out here, Michael. Achamor and then Aiyir, respectively. But Matthew's narrative has a female and a male instead. Tain honan kai ton polon. 
without an additional and unmotivated misreading of the donkey. Honos as female. As female, the double donkey reading of Zechariah 9.9 fails to account for the, the fact that the second donkey in Matthew's story is a Jenny. Similar considerations also doom the attempt to tie the two donkeys to Matthew's uh, penchant of do do doubling entities in his source, as with two uh, demonics of Matthew 8.28 and two blind men of 9.27. Doubling Mark's cult should then produce two cults, not a Jenny in a cult. So uh, just to pause here and and clear, just so you're clear on what, what uh, Stephen Carlson is arguing here, he's suggesting that, um, uh, so oh, I have to look at this again. Um, so he's suggesting that, um, the you remember from the Hebrew text, it says that there's a donkey, and it specifies that this donkey is um, a colt, the son of a draft animal. Um, so he's taking the that that draft animal or the son of draft animals. That's the feminine noun there. Remember that's feminine plural. So he's taking that term, the fact that the don the the donkey in the Hebrew is is the offspring of uh, of this these female donkeys. It's probably a figure of speech, basically meaning uh, you know the son of draft animals. That that this is a young a young foal. I think that's that's the point of what's happening in the Hebrew text. So Stephen Carlson is saying the presence of the feminine plural there indicates uh, that Matthew probably has that in mind when he's got to get the female donkey along with the colt into his narrative. So the other the other point that that he wants to make here, um, he talks about. Uh, some scholars have suggested that the reason there's two donkeys in Matthew is because Matthew has a tendency to double items in his text. Uh, instead of one blind man, there's two blind men. Instead of um, uh, one demoniac, there's there's two demoniacs, etc. Some have suggested, well, there's you know, instead of one animal, there's two animals here, and um, uh, so. Stephen Carlson makes the point that uh, if that were the case, then it should be two male donkeys because of the way the synop the the uh, sorry the synonymous parallelism works because they're both male in the Hebrew, and he's suggesting no because there's a Jenny here, a female uh, donkey, that this argument uh, doesn't work. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can see the point. Possibly, I, yeah, maybe I, I have no problem with, with that. Okay. Another scholar. Why is the female ass brought to the story? It seems reasonable to say on the outset that Matthew twenty-one two to seven does not derive the female ass from the text of Zechariah nine nine. So why exactly? I'm not entirely sure why Michael thought this was a useful um source to use in his presentation uh because this is uh th this is this is a point that's that's basically been universally uh uh noticed by scholars and this is really the issue with this story as i've i've tried to show and that is that in this text there's two donkeys instead of just one and one of them is female did matthew do this whole thing of the two donkeys well if you watch the full video that dr Herman is responding to i don't even know if paul actually played the full video for him which is fair it may not have had the time bernard Bado, a paper i cite in that video uh notes that what matthew is doing is actually a theme to show jesus's divinity in the old testament God is often carried on a throne of living creatures. What does Matthew do? He makes a throne of garments spread over two living creatures, which carry Jesus into Jerusalem. It's a way to say Jesus is divine. Because in the Old Testament and in the ancient Near East, deities were often carried on thrones, carried by living creatures. Matthew's doing the same thing. 
Matthew opens his gospel by saying Jesus is God with us, notes it throughout his gospel numerous times, and here's another way he does this. Jesus is being carried to the temple on a throne of living creatures, a throne of garments carried by two living creatures. The uh, Gundry notes in his commentary that the cloaks represent a widened throne that is being carried by the two donkeys. So there's an actual theological reason for this, but that doesn't mean he's saying Jesus rode, sat, was actually sitting on two donkeys. He's sitting on the cloaks spread about them. Furthermore, even if that's wrong, Carlson has another uh, point about it. So before we get to Carlson's point, which is the one that Rob brought up, um, I want to say something about this explanation by Bernard Battle of what's happening in this text. I think it is particularly reaching. Basically, he's suggesting that because within ancient Near Eastern imagery, remember, this is these are texts that go stretch back, you know, hundreds and hundreds thousands of years prior to the time that the evangelist is writing his gospel. So within these ancient Near Eastern texts, you see it a little bit in the Hebrew Bible as well. Um, a rule, a, 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 a deity is, is being born aloft on a throne carried by uh, two living creatures. And Bernard Battle says, well, that's exactly what's going on here. The, excuse me, the cloaks are the throne and the two donkeys are the draft animals like there's nothing native to the text itself which indicates that is what the author has in mind i think it's a huge stretch i don't buy it i would have to see uh some sort of more convincing connection to the uh, the ancient Near Eastern uh, imagery and and ideology there to uh, to 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 pick that up. I, I I think it's I think that's what Gundry says too about this that the 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 cloaks represent the throne. No, I mean there's yeah it, it's just it it's hugely problematic. If this is if this is what uh, the the Mathean evangelist is getting at. It's incredibly obscure, and I don't think it's meaningful in the sense that I very highly doubt anyone would have picked it up, any one of his readers. This. He knows this should, could, could just be a figure of speech. He says other scholars have taken to this interchange of number as a figure of speech, such as a whole part for a, a synecdoche. Okay, so Matthew may be just using a figure of speech. He says that Jesus sat on that. He could be referring to the donkeys, but it'd be a figure of speech. With this rhetorical figure, the plural refers to the collective whole as a single conceptual unit, even though certain actions may involve just one of the parts. Here, the basic idea of the plural donkey designates the team or train of donkeys, and sitting on a unit means sitting on the appropriate one of them. So sitting on one, even though you're referring to all of them. In other words, there is a synecdoche with donkey denoting the parts, but connotation... That's, that, that's not donkey, that's actually out tone. So that's the... That's the plural um, demonstrative uh, pronoun, not demonstrative, sorry. It's the, the plural personal pronoun. And honestly, like you can kind of see that, right? Like I don't even think you need to read Greek to recognize that that probably makes a sound like our tone. It certainly wouldn't be difficult to, to figure out and to learn. Imitating the whole and with forget the name, forget how to pronounce that Greek word, taking the whole... Did, how, how many of you guys actually actually believe that that Michael forgot to pronounce uh, epicathesin? Show of hands. Anyone? Anyone? As an argument, but applying the sitting action to one of the parts. It is not unprecedented in Greek to use Sinek the key for mounting a team of horses. Clear use is evident in the earliest of Greek literature, the Iliad. We're the, in the book, we're in book 10, Diomedes kills Ret Rhesus, while he is sleeping, and to escape, he mounts the victim's yoked horses and rides away. They smoked one. They didn't actually sit on all of them. He swiftly mounted the horses, is what it says. The synecdoche is an appropriate figure of speech when mounting one of a team of horses conceptualized as a unit, and Matthew's usage is consistent with this. Carlson notes Matthew... So, uh, this, is, this is the big point that Carlson makes at the end of his second... Uh, article, and this is what he thinks is going on here, is that this is a synecdoche, basically where uh, a figure of speech is used, where Jesus is is said to be sitting on 
them, the, the two animals, but because they're part of a team, he's actually just sitting on one. And Steven Carlson goes out to goes on to say the one he's sitting on is is the Colt as opposed to the uh, the Jenny or the uh, the, the female uh, donkey. Um, and this so this is uh, the question that that Rob raised with his very generous super chat. So this sounds like a reasonably good argument. And we have some some evidence from uh, Greek texts where something like this occurs. Uh, he cites um, the Iliad, where in book 10, Diomedes kills Rhesus while he's sleeping. And then to escape, he mounts the victim's yoked horses and rides away. So the idea is he's got a team of horses and he's sitting on just one of them. He's not sitting on both of them. But in the text there, it says that uh, that he he mounted the horses, basically both of them. Uh, it's, it's plural there. So problem solved, right? Um, now, I know that there are some scholars, at least, who have not found this especially convincing because within the Iliad and within uh, um, the, the yeah, I think there's another text there where, where this, this, uh, this image appears. Within those texts, importantly, you're dealing with horses. And you're also dealing with a team. So they are under the same yoke is the idea here, right? They're a yoked unit and the rider is sitting on one of them. It's difficult to arrive at that same kind of image for a female and a male donkey with cloaks draped over top of them. Uh, the lack of yoking is, is the problem here and that's how it works within the Greek texts, uh, in particular within the, uh, within the, the, the Roman perspective, uh, of this as well. So that's, that's my problem with it. I, I would say though, that's probably the best explanation for, um, you know, understanding this in real world terms. Matthew did not make a huge blunder here. He's basically saying this could just, even if Matthew is referring to him sitting on the donkeys, this could just be a figure of speech that we see in other Greek texts. It's not that Matthew flubbed the new, the uh, the Old Testament. It's that he could just be using a figure of speech here. So, all right. So that that covers basically the whole two donkey thing. It just seems like Dr. Ehrman is actually quite ignorant of a lot of the scholarship around this, which I was actually surprised when i saw his response in this he just didn't seem aware of it he just said well i got this from a catholic scholar which is kind of strange all right so that's the part of michael's video that i wanted to cover um so what's going on here um is jesus riding on two animals um is he just riding on one is there a reasonable explanation to what's happening here? Does he read the Hebrew Bible? And can we understand and draw that out from this story in particular, Matthew's version of it? What's going on? So remember at the outset that I said Matthew's priority here is what? And this is really important. Matthew's priority is to get two animals into this story. Why? That's the question. Why does Matthew want two animals here? Is it because, as Gundry suggested, that he there's some historical memory here of there being two animals uh, present when Jesus entered Jerusalem? Is that the reason? Is it that uh, he's just determined, based on his reading of this prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 to make this align with Mark's version of the story and this is the solution he's provided to this is it as Ehrman suggests following John Meyer that Matthew just doesn't understand how Hebrew parallelism works and therefore mistranslates or misunderstands the uh, uh, the the Greek oh shoot I am sorry, Neil. <laughs> I did miss that. Uh, oh, I covered it. Oh, good. Phew. Well, thank you for throwing me all your money, Neil. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, but 
uh, yeah. So I, I already talked about that. The importance of understanding uh, the significance of a word like Prouse in uh, Matthew's uh, citation here. So what's going on? How do we arrive at a solution? So at the outset, I have to say this. I think a lot of scholars uh, reject this idea that Jesus, that Jesus, sorry, Matthew just doesn't understand Hebrew parallelism or that he's not Jewish because of the way that he reads Zechariah 9 9. I think it's fair that this is rejected. Um, in my opinion, Matthew is probably a Hellenized Jew. And I, I, I think that um that might help to explain his handling of the scriptures i'm not always convinced that it does but a number of commentators have also pointed out that what matthew is doing in this particular passage and a lot of times throughout his own gospel is he's reading the jewish scriptures very much the same way that other jews are reading their scriptures we have this whole wealth of material now from Qumran, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which show us um, with stunning clarity the ways in which Jews handled their scriptures. And one of the things that we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in a lot of the texts that are preserved in the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, in other texts, like even, even in Josephus, one of the things that we see is that early Jewish readers were not terribly encumbered by context or meaning when they approached their scriptures. So I have no problem at all with Matthew understanding how Hebrew parallelism works and just choosing to ignore it. Like, that's entirely plausible here. So, um, the Septuagint translation itself, uh, I would suggest, makes the parallel ambiguous. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up my screen again because I think I got a couple of other, um, couple of other slides here to show. They may just be repeats, guys. So bear with me, but it's important. It's my it's my stream. Gonna do what I want. All right. So yeah. Again, I'm just going to repeat the significance and the importance of this, this translation of the three passages together that was provided by my friend Stephen Nelson, uh, I think illustrates abundantly clear what Matthew wants to do. So, as noted, the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew itself kind of makes the parallel ambiguous like it's it's you could read it in there remember it says uh gentle and sitting on a donkey and a new colt you could read the parallel in there but it's possible to miss it too if you're just going by the septuagint so was it missed by matthew it seems possible to me but again i think it's just as equally possible that he simply didn't care. He didn't care because oftentimes that's what uh, what early Jews did. So uh, something else that Matthew does is he makes, I think what he's doing with his version of the Zechariah 9 verse 9 quotation is he's he's very concerned to make the relationship between these animals more clear, between the Hupazugion and the honos right in um in in the septuagint or the um chamor and the ayir and the atonot in the hebrew if you prefer his 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 primary concern is to make this clear so the the polos the colt is the offspring of the Hupazugion, which is neuter, and the Hupazugion is a reference to the Honos, which is feminine uh, by implication, right? And we see that in passages like in Matthew 21, verse 2, where it says, uh, you will find the Honos tied and the Polos, the, the uh, colt with 
her. So I think Matthew needs scripture that Polos has never been mounted. Uh, this is made clear in Mark 11, verse 2, the text that Matthew is literally reading and copying verbatim. What does Mark say? Mark says that you will find a polos, a colt, on whom no man has ever sat. And so Matthew's looking at that and he's pulling out I've got this scripture in Zechariah 9, verse 9, where it, it's, it's yes, it's got this parallel statement. Let's pretend that Matthew understands how Hebrew parallelism works. He's, I've got this parallel statement of the king entering Jerusalem on a donkey, on a colt fold by donkeys, by draft animals. Sounds pretty similar. I'm going to uh, write that into my story as a way to illustrate that this is an animal, a young animal, on which no man has sat. I think this is his solution for drawing the scripture in to explain what Mark has written. So, um, in my opinion, uh, I think the changes make sense of the film the fulfillment it doesn't seem likely to me that matthew is reading the masoretic text that he's reading the the hebrew at all in this passage and here's why the reason is because he is quoting verbatim from a greek text up until we get right to the end here like so he's either got like a Greek text in front of him and, you know, a Hebrew scroll of Zechariah and he copies verbatim the Greek text and then goes, hold on, this last bit, I'm just going to translate directly from the Hebrew after I've painstakingly found it in my scroll. That doesn't seem particularly realistic to me. I, I have to think that Matthew... I don't know, maybe he's drawing some of this from memory. I know I've seen this suggested, that he's 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 drawing the idea from memory. That's possible. I wouldn't expect such a precise match to the Septuagint text in that case. Uh, what's going on? Is Matthew translating from the Hebrew? Uh, honestly, I would say maybe, but it seems doubtful. As mentioned... Matthew, when he quotes scripture, has like a mix. Uh, sometimes he quotes directly from the Septuagint, but oftentimes, most of the time, he's got this free, highly paraphrastic use of scriptures. Some of these look like they could reflect translations of the Hebrew, but the with the fluidity and with the liberty that Matthew seems to employ in in treating his texts, in treating his scriptures, I tend to think not. Uh, I think it's possible that in this last line, he could have come up with a rendering himself while reading the Septuagint. Uh, the word huios, son, uh, which, you know, scholars have looked at this, this, this phrase, epihuios, uh, as corresponding to the Hebrew va'al, what is it? It's it's uh, va'al ayir, uh, and said, "Oh, look, you know that that's a perfect match." Well, the word weos in Greek is interchangeable with that other word neos, meaning new, uh, for animal offspring. Uh, in the Bauer Art Gingrich dictionary, sorry, is it Bauer Art Denker? Gingrich, that's right. Uh, it says that the word weos, meaning son, can refer to the immediate male offspring of an animal. You have uh, examples like this in Psalm chapter 28, verse 1, in Sirach 38, verse 25. So um, I would say, I think it's, it seems possible that Matthew could have arrived at that rendering on his own, and it happens to look something like uh, the Septuagint. These things are possible, right? Um, so he changed the first animal 
from masculine to feminine, the second offspring of the first. It's important for Matthew to have Jesus sitting, I think, on two donkeys, not just the polos. And this is a big change from Mark and from the Hebrew prophecy itself. Remember, the the animal, there's only one animal in the Hebrew prophecy, and it's male. In Mark, there's only one animal, and it's male. It's a polos. Again, uh, within the text, within the, within the text that we have from Matthew, you'll notice that it says he sat on what the onos kai polon, the female donkey and the male donkey. So it kind of looks like Matthew has prioritized the female animal, which is a departure from everyone. That's nowhere in any of the texts. Uh, my friend Stephen uh, Nelson pulled up this, uh, this quote from Origen, which I think is, is rather telling of what the early church fathers thought was going on here. Origen says they did not leave the animals bare, but placed around them a decoration with garments conveying gracefulness, adorning the she-ass and the colt with it that they had loosed with such things as they themselves were adorned and covered, in order that with the garments of the disciples who teach adorning the she-ass and the colt, the Logos of God might mount upon and might rest and seat himself upon them. Origen certainly seems to think that uh, Jesus had mounted two animals. Being the sole driver, because those who were loosed and are bearing him. But Jesus is seated upon the garments of those who teach that were placed upon the she-ass and the colt. Since each person needs to contribute something to Christ, the lowly king seated on a beast of burden and young colt. By the way, uh, Another important thing to point out here is that uh, the reading from A.T. Robinson, that, uh, um, um, what's his name? Tim McGrew cited at the very beginning of the video. It's not novel. This is something Origen was already saying. They're sitting on the cloaks, right? But importantly, they're also sitting on two. He's also sitting on two animals. So something that else is that I think is also really likely here is that Matthew is reading a different recension, a Greek recension of the Hebrew text. One of the things that we have learned in our discovery about early Judaism from the massive amounts of literature that we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls is that um, in addition to multiple versions of Greek translations, of the Hebrew text, we also have multiple versions of Hebrew texts. And this is a point that is constantly being made by such scholars who are working regularly within this field. Um, so this is something that was that was pointed out also in uh, W.D. Davies and uh, Dale Allison's fine commentary that Michael actually called upon to support his argument, but look at what they say in a footnote here. They say, Aquila, Symmachus, Theodosian, Hexapla of Zechariah 9.9. So those are all four separate Greek versions of the Hebrew text. They all use onos. See further, Menken, pages 573 to 74, he observes that, quote, all those elements of Matthew's translation which make it into a better one than the Septuagint are also found in one or more of the later Greek translations of the Old Testament in Achilla, Symmachus, Theodosian, and Quinta. And he speculates that Matthew's translation is derived from a Greek recension of the Old Testament no longer extant. Also, uh, Emmanuel Tov, perhaps the greatest living text critic of the Hebrew Bible, as well as the Septuagint, uh, said in a lecture 
that was recorded and posted on YouTube. I've actually included the link to his full one and a half hour talk in the uh in the description of this video uh i decided not to pull up the video itself because the audio is awful so this is what emmanuel tove has to say the new testament gospels and paul often quote from the text via a greek intermediary talking about the text of the hebrew bible to all intents and purposes the kai gay theodosian revision of the septuagint reflects the proto masoretic text so what he's getting at here is that there is a recension a greek recension of the hebrew bible that we know of called the kai gay theodosian recension and it is characterized by a much closer rendering of the original hebrew than we see in what we call the old greek or in the Septuagint. And this is borne out by manuscripts that we've discovered at Qumran. There are a handful of Greek translations of Hebrew Bible texts that were found at Qumran in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they show something pretty remarkable and also fairly confusing, because all of these texts were designated as Septuagint manuscripts because they were written in Greek. However, uh, they actually follow very closely to the Masoretic text, to the Hebrew text, as opposed to the Septuagint. So it seems very likely, especially given the fact that within this single quotation that Matthew is drawing from of Zechariah 9, he's already comp quoting verbatim uh, the Septuagint text. It seems pretty likely, it seems quite plausible that uh, his version just happens to match the Hebrew text closer than, you know, our surviving Septuagint version. And this is what Emmanuel Tov says with regards to a lot of the literature that's in the New Testament. He says, um, the Septuagint reflects the Proto-Masoretic text, which is the text many identified with Pharisaic rabbinic circles. The New Testament often quotes the so-called Kaige Theodosian text of the Greek Bible and not the Septuagint. In other words, the text of the very people that the New Testament often criticizes is quoted in the New Testament. So, oh, I've been going over two hours now. Uh, there are still 295 people here, which is amazing. That kind of wraps up everything I wanted to say about this video from Michael Jones. And I think the important takeaway from this is uh, the following. Uh, we don't know whether or not Matthew was quoting the Hebrew directly, and we have no idea about his proficiency with Hebrew. This text does not prove that. Uh, what's happening within this text is much more complicated in terms of how Matthew is uh, drawing from his source, whether it's the Septuagint or something like the Masoretic text written in Greek, uh, or just from his own memory. It's way more nuanced and complicated than Michael presents, and he should probably have avoided making these kinds of arguments because he clearly doesn't really understand how to make them from the languages. Without knowing the Greek and the Hebrew, I mean, how can he possibly know the, the value and the strength and the force of the arguments that certain people are making? So, guys, I recognize that not everyone has the time, the wherewithal, or the skills to pick up original biblical languages. Some of us are stupid enough to have committed as much of our lives as we have to learning these texts, and it is time-consuming, and it's painful. But if you're going to dive in with both feet or dive it you dive head first right that's how you dive you you either jump into the water or you cannonball or you dive if you're going to dive in head first as michael jones has had has as michael jones has 
if you're going to regularly make arguments on the basis of the languages behind the text, I don't think it's too much to expect that you can actually read them. All right. That's all I got. I think there's a few more uh, super chats here. Uh, we did Rob's on the synecdoche. Uh, we did um, translating the New Testament into Greek. Uh, Mr. Brainig has gifted me two Australian dollars. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, Eric Webb. Just wanted to say thank you. Be well. Thank you very much for your uh, your donation of five dollars. I'm pretty good today. Um, it's super cold here for some reason lately. I don't know why, um, but I'm feeling okay. Thanks for uh, thanks for asking though. M M. Thank you for the four dollar and ninety nine cent super chat. I'm so happy to catch you live. I love your stuff. Was finally able to join the Patreon too. Yes. Thank you for the quality content. Well, you're very welcome. I am so happy that you were able to be here live as well. Uh, for those of you who are interested in supporting my work, the easiest way to do that is to join my Patreon. There's a link in the description. Those who are patron members actually got a full PDF copy of all the notes that I made for this video. I, you know, I will, uh, you will get access, early access to all my videos. You'll get bonus content. I've been publishing their snippets of the uh, current book that I'm working on. So you'll get early access to that. Sometimes we do hangouts. I uh, haven't done one in a while and I'm currently working on figuring out how to do another one. So that's the easiest way to support me. Another way to support me is to buy the course, which is also linked in the description. Real Israelite religions, facts on the ground, a propaganda in the Bible. Uh, something else that I've included, I'm starting to include in all my videos is a direct link, a direct donation link. If you're interested in just helping me uh, to, to, to commit more time to uh, writing the book in order to get it finished in a timely manner, you'll find that linked in the description as well. Uh, I'll say one other thing about the course. So um, uh, listen, um, Bart Ehrman, uh, there's this amazing fixation or fascination that Christian apologists have with Bart Ehrman. They're kind of obsessed with him. I think uh, on a, and it's a weird sort of relationship too, because on the one hand you have like apologists constantly complaining about our Bart Ehrman and his scholarship. And then out of the other side of their mouth, they're, they're, they're pulling uh, arguments that that Bart will make in in an effort to bolster their own ideas. It's kind of weird. Um, so I just wanted to say something about the uh, the video itself. the The original video that Michael was reviewing was made by my good friend Paulagia. Uh, Paulagia used this video in an effort to try and promote this course that Bart made on Matthew. And if that's something you're interested in, why not go buy the course? Uh, I've linked Paula Gia's description, uh, Paula Gia's video in my, my description. You can find the information there. But in addition, if you're interested in buying my own course, I've actually also included uh, a link to my course uh, through which uh, Paul can get some affiliate money. So if you want to support both of us, uh, you can do so by clicking on that link in the video description uh, to buy my course. But m and or just M-M, thank you so much for your $5 super chat. I really appreciate it. Wow, another big one. Appian Space for $20. I enjoy your work on YouTube. You're a great teacher. I really appreciate that. Um, I strive to be a good communicator and a quality teacher. So to hear you say that really just makes my day. I really hope everyone found this uh, useful and educational. I mean, that's one of the things that I really 
strive to do in my space here on YouTube is to dive into the weeds of these issues a little bit and try and make them uh, more understandable to people while also not insulting your intelligence. So please let me know. Uh, let me know if you enjoyed the stream. Uh, throw it out there in the chat, people. Uh, yeah, we saw we saw Gnostic Informants uh, super chat about Prouse. My good friend, Captain Dadpool, thank you very much for the $10 super chat. Uh, I understand while they usually don't. But I'm glad to see actual scholars starting to respond to these YouTube apologists who speak with more confidence than they have earned. Cheers. Thank you. And this is something that I feel, um, you know, there's a space for a few of us, uh, myself, uh, d d my good friends, Dan McClellan, Dr. Josh Bowen, Dr. Jennifer Bird, Dr. Uh, Matthew Monger. Uh, a guy over at uh, uh, the channel, uh, Tablets and Tables. No, Tablets. Tablets and Temples. Sorry. <laughs> or is it Temples and Tablets? It's one or the other. It's either Tablets and Temples or Temples and Tablets. Uh, his name is Lachlan Davis. Uh, he broadcasts out of Australia. He is a Biblical Studies PhD, and he's does some phenomenal work over there um get you know making publicly accessible scholarship but this is this is something that there are there are a bunch of us who have a burden for we have a burden for this and and we're eager to get more of this content out i'll mention at this point too uh next sunday not this sorry not this sunday but sunday uh march the 17th i'm going to be coming back with all my friends for the second installment of the Diablo Critics at 11 o'clock Pacific Time, Sunday, uh, 17th of March. Don't miss it. But thank you again, uh, Captain Dabpool, for your friendship as well as your generous super chat. Michael Beverly, good to see you. Holy smokes. It's in dollars. It's not in Mexican pesos. Wow. For $16.66. I see what you did there. And you didn't cheap out on me. Very nice. <gasps> Puzzle from C.S. Lewis, The Last Battle, if compared to 2 Samuel 17.23. Uh, Athithophel suicide. Okay. Uh, and 1 Kings 1.33, Solomon riding David's mule. And Deuteronomy 22.10, don't mix donkey and ox explains and fixes all yeah i think that's a good point uh there are a variety of ways of dealing with this text in an effort to make sense of why uh matthew wanted two donkeys in this story as opposed to just one um the other one that that was uh that was mentioned by um dale allison and uh, W.D. Davies was that Matthew is trying to equate Jesus with Moses. And there's a story in um, Exodus chapter four where Moses rides into Egypt with it has has his family riding into Egypt on two uh, donkeys um, there. And, and then again, yeah, uh, David rides into the city of Jerusalem on two donkeys right like there's there's ways to work through why uh matthew does what he does but like importantly people we 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 don't know which is why there are so many explanations however what i will suggest is it's not outlandish this i think this is the critical point it's not outlandish to think that um matthew wasn't bothered by synonymous parallelism, didn't care about it, maybe didn't know it, but I think clearly didn't care about it. Um, the other point, I I think he 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 wanted Jesus riding two animals, and I don't think he had a problem with that either. Sure, it looks weird to us, but Matthew doesn't seem to have cared. But thank you, Michael Beverly, for the super chat and for being here. It's good to see you. Cheryl Lyle, wow! Thank you for the twenty dollars super chat. This is uh, this is another one of my very generous patrons. 
with 320 people watching. If you haven't purchased Dr. Kip's MVP course, you should. It's excellent. Dr. Kip is the real scholar you want to follow. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. I hope you follow all my friends, uh, not just me, uh, but I, I, I very sincerely appreciate the support. Proving Islam for $2. How much do you as a Bible scholar read every day? Uh, not as much as I should, <laughs> and some days more so than others. Um, and with regards to like, I, I'm pro I probably read something every day, but my days are split between, uh, reading and writing predominantly. So it, it, it varies now and then. And now too, I spend a lot of time creating content too, which involves tons of reading and writing as well. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's a lot. I, I feel like I, I do read quite a bit. I've I felt it important to to provide a robust treatment to just this question about uh, Matthew's usage of the Old Testament, his knowledge of Hebrew, his his uh, why on earth he's introduced two donkeys to this this story. I, I felt uh, uh, strongly enough about this that like I pulled out a bunch of commentaries and I wrote a few articles in preparation just for this stream. But uh, thank you very much for the question. Hard work or hardly working? <laughs> Sorry. For $4.99, Sentinel Apologetics and other apologists using Homer's works to justify reading in Matthew on this issue are inadvertently justifying Dennis McDonald? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think uh, I think it's a good point. the The important point here to make is that the gospel writers were thoroughly saturated by their Hellenized uh, Roman Greek speaking world, and we see the fingerprints of this all over uh, the Gospels. Uh, something that was pointed out to me by uh, Candida Moss, who is a uh, professor of Bible over at the University of Birmingham just uh, the other day, was how much uh, it's very interesting to see how much Latin technical terminology appears in Mark's Gospel. Hmm. I didn't even know. I don't know Latin. But uh, it's a great point. Okay, uh, a couple more here. Uh, Corhill for five uh, dollars. I don't know what that is, so I'm not going to try and guess. But thank you very much for the super chat. I'm going to start a revolt with Neil. If you, oh no, <laughs> what did I miss? Oh no, please, what did I miss, Corhill? I got to go back and. Look, uh, oh, thank you. Sorry. I'm sorry. I skipped it, right? Oh my God. I'm sorry that this cost you more than, than it should have. How terrible of me. <laughs> okay. How important was the book of Daniel for early Christians? Did Jesus think he was going to fulfill the prophecy himself? Or do you agree with Bart that he didn't see himself as the son of man? Uh, honestly, I have not spent enough time uh, thinking through uh, this issue on uh, what Jesus, what Jesus' own self-conception is. I, I don't spend a lot of time in the New Testament. Uh, most of my thing is is you know the Jewish text, so I spend a lot of time in the New Testament as it pertains to their handling of the Jewish text. And um, I will say, I'm not. I'm also not sure how important a lot of Christians felt, or a lot of the early Christians felt, Daniel was. I mean, certainly, uh, Mark quotes the uh, the prophecy from. Uh, I think it's it's either Daniel seven or Daniel nine. I'm 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 going to get it wrong, of seeing the Son of Man coming. Uh, so Matthew quotes from the uh, the prophecy in Daniel, but there's not piles of uh, Daniel scripture 
um, strewn throughout the New Testament. And, you know, something that I often come back to is if the early Christian writers were as, you know, hung up about the book of Daniel as many people seem to think they were, I have a tendency th to think they would have spent a lot more time grappling with the calendrical issues in that are introduced in Daniel, well, introduced in, in the book of Enoch and also the book of Jubilees, but really popularized in the book of Daniel. I think that would have been much more of a factor uh, in their writing if they really w if they really were just immersed in uh, in Daniel. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I, something that I certainly could uh, stand to look into more. Got a few more here. Uh, Sentinel Apologetics. Sorry, Sentinel Apologetics is back. Wow, I really appreciate it, Rob. I really do um and i uh, i'll just i'll just uh say this uh to you I, it's probably time you and i talked um face to face uh about some stuff but uh yeah thanks again for the very generous uh, super chat thanks skip i appreciated your graciousness here with regards to uh mcdonald's my mises and walsh's work on it i actually like it Nice. You should. It's good stuff. As Goodacre says, it bolsters the ingeniousness of the New Testament writers. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to quibble with you there. And I, I hope that's something that comes through loud and clear in the stream as well. One of the great disservices to, uh, to the texts, I think that this, this question does is to paint the, the writer of the gospel of Matthew, like a rube like he didn't know what he was doing or like he he oh what a, what a dummy he doesn't even understand how how hebrew parallelism works uh i think i think that's incredibly uncharitable i think it's inaccurate i think the new testament writers were various levels of genius as most of if not all the biblical writers were uh, within antiquity if you could write literature you had to be incredibly smart you had to have mastered numerous uh, skills and ideas. And uh, when you dive into the literature, one of the things that makes it so engaging and so exciting is just how layered and intricate and malleable so much of it is. So I think, I think there are a lot of things that you and I, Rob, will part company over but this is not one of them i think you would agree with me that uh all the biblical writers are extremely bright thanks for the super chat but uh what else do i have here i got a couple more coffee breath uh been talking to my wife haven't you can you settle a debate oh no it's <laughs> It's a oh no okay sorry uh, that's a transliteration rakia in Genesis one is it better translated expanse or dome firmament uh, I think from a a uh, the I think the the lexical data supports this I think the contextual data and the literary data support this that uh, the better translation is dome or firmament coffee breath is getting at um the mention in genesis chapter one of god creating the rakia or the firmament it's right there in the latin translation which is has entered our english vernacular Maybe not so much our vernacular, but it entered the English vernacular at one time. Uh, I think that this is a hardened surface. I think this is the most natural way to read the word. It derives from a verb. All Hebrew words derive from verbal roots. All verbal roots have um, like earlier Canaanite um, and other ancient, other Near Eastern, usually Akkadian uh, cognates. Um, and all of this data suggests that this is a hardened surface. 
Uh, it can be translated in it, it's it can be translated as expands in the sense of spreading out. However, in these instances, I would suggest that this is drawing from the idea that this is a uh, like a beaten metal surface, like what a what a a, a forger would do with a piece of metal as he's pounding it out in an effort to flatten it. That's the image that you get in Genesis chapter one when it describes the substance of the sky. Uh, thank you very much for your super chat. I hope that answers your question. I got one more here from my friend Jason over at the Hebrew Cafe. Thanks for all you do, Kip. Well, thank you, Jason, for the very generous 17.9 shekels. I uh, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Jason over at the Hebrew Cafe runs like regular Hebrew reading streams. If you're keen on reading uh, more Hebrew and you can't get enough, he does it. Uh, he does it regularly, I believe. Uh, every Wednesday, Thursday. I think he does it a couple times each week. Sometimes he's working. He he works through through uh, exercises. Sometimes they're just reading texts. It's pretty great. Um, and at this point, I will just mention to you that I'm coming back tomorrow evening for a live stream at five thirty. Uh, five o'clock Pacific, eight o'clock Eastern time with my good friend, Dr. Joshua Bowen over at Digital Hammurabi, where we will be continuing with our series, Kiryat Ibrit, where we read through uh, Hebrew texts and go through the grammar and the syntax and some of the interesting features. It's geared at like a second year reading level. I think it's a great resource for students in seminary who are learning the language. It's a great way to help with your pronunciation and also with just getting familiar with the text and the language and how they work. And I will commend also the Hebrew Cafe as another resource, a better resource probably actually than ours because of how much depth Jason has a tendency to to go into this kind of stuff, right? So check it out, please, if that's something you're interested in. Check us out tomorrow uh, when we're back for another installment of Kitty Ati Breet. Um, thanks, guys, for coming out and hanging out with me for like two and a half hours. There's still 270 people watching, which is insane to me. Uh, really good to see you. Uh, Chrissy, thanks for making it out. The greatest of all Greek speakers, Richard Bayesian Sperm Bank Carrier. Michael should get lessons from him. I'm sure Kip agrees. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced, uh, Richard Carrier's Greek is fantastic. Um, uh, to be fair, I don't think my Greek is is fantastic uh this is my number three language probably so i'm i make a lot of mistakes with the greek but i i try pretty hard to 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 make sure i don't make too many uh but i will say uh richard carrier's greek is certainly leaps and bounds better than uh, michael jones's non-existent greek and honestly michael if you do ever watch this i hope you do if you want to learn the language there are people out there who can teach you i would be willing to teach you if you were interested let's talk like seriously if this it seems to be something that you want to do but haven't done yet uh, for whatever reason. Come on, buddy. It's time. It's time you learn the languages. Get on it. Get it done. If you want help with it, I'm right here. But I know you know people who can help you too. Anyways, uh, thanks again, guys, for coming out. Uh, I think I'm going to shut it down. It's four o'clock over here. I should probably walk the dogs because they haven't been walked. My wife had her wisdom teeth pulled on Friday and she's still recovering. She's, she's in a bit of a pain. Oh, oh I should not. Sorry. I was, I was afraid. Like, was, oh dear. Uh, thank God. My wife never watches my, uh, my content. Eh? <laughs> um, yeah. So she's still in pain, in pain. I meant to say she's still in pain. Um, 
Yeah. So, uh, but I, I'm, I'm looking after a bunch of, a bunch of stuff here. I'm going to go walk the dogs. Then I'm going to go feed the dogs and then I need to get supper going. Thanks. Ever, thanks again, everyone for, uh, coming out, uh, come back tomorrow to watch, uh, Kitty at Ibrit. And after Kitty at Ibrit, um, our, our Hebrew stream, I'm going to be off, uh, I think until uh, we come back with uh, Diablo Critics on the 17th of March. So make sure you check that out as well. 17th of March, it's Sunday. It's on at 11 o'clock Pacific time. All right, guys. Be good. I will see you later.